We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine. Emily is still on a deserted island. So we have Paul, my dad, as guest host again. Welcome back. Well, thank you. I am very happy to be here and happy to be subbing for Emily. And hopefully, hopefully she finds her way off of her deserted island. Eventually. We'll see. Um, no, she will be back next week for Abu Dhabi. The fact that next week is Abu Dhabi is kind of ridiculous. And the fact that we have a triple header, including Vegas and Qatar, in back-to-back weeks is still a little weird to me. But we've already well, talked about many times about how weird this calendar has been this season. Well, they're, they're, they're neighbors, sort of. They're both deserts. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with that because <laughs> geographically Qatar is, of course, very, very close. Um, yeah. And basically everybody, unless your name was like George Russell, just had to like pack your stuff and get out of Vegas just so they could start acclimating to the time difference in Qatar so that they can be prepared for this this weekend's race, which I think to be helpful is also a night race. Yes, but time zones are hard. Time zones are very difficult. And I'll... I'll yeah, I th- but it's a night race for them. It's a morning race for us. Correct. Yes. Correct. Like I, but anyway, like I said, time, time, time zones, zones are hard. hard. <laughs> right. I'm, just, I'm just really glad that the Formula One app like tells me what time races are, track time and also my time. So that way I have to do slightly less math. That's a good thing. That's a good yes. thing. So. Exactly. Another good thing, I think, is they just announced today, Wednesday, that Monza, the Italian Grand Prix that everyone actually likes, has extended for the next six years into 2031. Uh, The current contract was set to end in 2025. So it's nice to see that they just, you know, knocked that off the list and we don't have to worry about all the speculation of if Monza is going to stay on the calendar or not. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about Monza. I think it's one of the best European races Uh, on the calendar. Um, I certainly find it better than Emilia, uh, you know, in Rome. It's, it's just, it's just a lot more fun. Yeah. Imola. And and we talked about this in our, in our Imola reaction earlier this season, Imola is just very difficult with the current generation of cars, which will hopefully be helped with the 2026 version of the car but right now if you have to compare Imola to Monza there is a clear winner there and it is definitely Monza 100% 100% yep i agree yeah. now with the with the shorter and uh less wide cars coming up in the new uh configuration it might change but we'll have to see i mean it might, it probably will. It, you know, the, the smaller cars should help in a lot of different tracks. Imola and Monaco are the you know ones that really come to mind first. Right. But there's just something about Imola. And I understand how historic it is, like from a, a time way before I became a Formula One fan. But I just, it's just not as good of a race, in my opinion. Not, not today. Not today, and I and I agree with you on that because there are, uh, I mean, you know, even even Silverstone, which has you know has all of this grandeur and has been around since, you know, the, the early fifties, as you know, has was much more exciting than Imola. Yeah, I think there were a lot more a lot of races that were a lot more exciting than Imola. But 100%. anyway, yep. We don't need to talk about Imola. We have something more important to talk about. And this is something that we've called the inevitable. And the inevitable is here. Formula One has reached an agreement in principle, which basically means it's it's definitely probably going to happen unless something really weird happens. But Cadillac and GM are joining Formula One as an 11th team in 2026. This is big. This is this really is- big because it, it, it brings uh, the U.S. market really into focus for Formula One. Yeah, I think that's the, the, one of the, the most important things about this is this is, and nothing against Haas, but Haas is an Italian team with an American hat. This is going to be an American team. And I think that's really important for the growth of the sport. I think that's really important for, you know, 
Formula One in general. And of course, this all goes back to the failed Andretti bid that was rejected earlier this year, because this is still basically the Andretti bid wearing a different hat. Yes. And my theory is uh, that the real difference is Formula One did not want to create another team like Haas, which Correct. has, you know, a U.S. head and an Italian base. It wanted to create a team that had the possibility, not guaranteed, of course, but the possibility of being another engine supplier. Right, which right now the plan, speaking of Italians, is the plan is to to have this new team be a customer team when they come on in 2026 and then become a works team toward the end of the decade. Because, of course, this is the podcast that only talks about the future of Formula One. Uh, 2028, 2029 ish is where we could, would see GM coming in as the constructor, as, as the constructor and as the engine supplier. But before then, they'll probably go with Ferrari as a customer team because it makes the most sense. They all are one of the works teams that doesn't have a lot of clients. You know, Mercedes is full up now that they have Alpine coming in again. Honda is moving from the Red Bull family to Aston Martin and Red Bull is going to be their, their own works team. Mercedes is their own works team. Sauber is, you know, moving to Audi in 2026 as well. So it, it gives Ferrari some room to have another customer for a few years. But what was interesting, and I saw, I saw this in a video I watched about the whole, this whole situation, is that if things don't work out with Ferrari, because of this agreement, Formula One can make the, cons the engine supplier with the least amount of clients supply this new team, which right now that is Honda. So they could make Honda supply Cadillac as well. That's actually very interesting. I think that, and especially since Mario has already come out publicly as a member of the board of directors of, of the uh, General Motors team to say that the goal is to get a deal with Ferrari, it, it makes the most sense. And, you know, because Ferrari is losing Sauber uh, to Audi, it, it, also, it also makes sense. And there has been some questions about what is Honda's true commitment to Formula One going forward? And well, that's going to be- Emily and I have talked about that heavily in our F1 genealogy series of how Honda loves being in Formula One when the going is good, but then they leave when, as soon as like right. the economy you know, takes a tumble in any way because uh, they were going to leave Formula One when they left Red Bull. And then, you know, Lawrence Stroll and Aston Martin said, hey, come, you know, come stick around with us. So it's probably a better bet for Cadillac GM to, you know, go with Ferrari because Ferrari is not going anywhere. Exactly. And that's and that's the crux of my argument here is that, you know, Honda was probably promised a boatload of money from Daddy Stroll to keep their engines uh, with Austin Martin. And, you know, you sometimes, you know, money talks and you can't turn that down. So you right. have to, you have to have that flexibility because if you look at, and I don't want to get too far off track, if you look at the Olympic sports world, a number of the Japanese companies are pulling back their sponsorships because they don't see as much of the value at the top level and top also meaning IOC's top program with their, uh, you know, major, uh, major marketing campaigns. Yeah. Plus the aftermath of the Japanese, you know, Olympics was a little bit, there have been some issues po post uh, the, the Olympics in Japan, but oh, people that's going a podcast to for another day. For graft. It, it, it's, you know, it's just these little somethings, but. I we mean, digress. Yeah, we, we digress a little bit. That's, that's what happens. But to go back to your point about Mario Andretti. So Mario Andretti, as you said, is going to be on the board of directors for this totally non-Andretti involved project that has nothing to do with Andretti, except the fact that the team is going to be owned by an organization called TWG Global, which owns Andretti Motorsport. Weird, And right? I believe is going to be headquartered in... The UK, where Andretti Global has a factory. You mean you mean where they set up shop for their Formula One project in Silverstone? Yeah, amazing, isn't that? What, what, so how, so how weird. 
How convenient. Yeah. And so a lot of this all came together, of course, when it was announced that Michael Andretti was going to be stepping away from leadership of Andretti Global. The CEO of TWG Global is now a guy named Dan Tauris, who is, he's going to be the, you know, the, the guy in charge, in charge, the whole project. But does this mean that this is the end of Michael Andretti's involvement with the project? We don't know. Maybe for now. Um, obviously, he's a bit of a polarizing figure amongst the rest of Formula One. So the fact that he did step away kind of speaks to the the sudden turnaround of willingness to have this totally not Andretti team. Yes, it it actually made things uh, move a lot quicker, uh, which may have been helpful for the process. And frankly, you know, this is this is really good for Formula One on so many fronts. It gives you an 11th team. It gives you now 22 drivers to root for. It gives you more of a foothold in the United States that is, you know, one of the great growth markets for Formula One. Yeah, exactly. And it's only getting bigger in the States. You know, we can we can thank this current, you know, drive to survive era um, and what that has done for, for Formula One and for, for Formula One's growth. And in my opinion, this is better than Middle Eastern investment. I'll leave that. I'll leave that right where we'll, it is. We'll leave that there. Um, yes. But to to other other things of interest, the this Cadillac GM organization, one of the sticking points, of course, to adding a new team right now, it has always been the Concord Agreement and specifically the dilution fee in the Concord Agreement, because as you. If you are, if you've been listening to the podcast long enough, you know that there is a prize pool of money that each of the ten, soon to be eleven teams, will take from at the end of the year. And the further up the constructor standings is, the more money you get. And the further down is, the more wind tunnel time you get. That's the the trade off. And you know, for years, the dilution fee as part of the overall operation agreement of Formula One has been around two hundred million dollars, which, at the time that the agreement was passed was a lot of money. Now Formula One is valued at way more, probably three times more than it was, and that's just spitballing here. So a $200 million dilution fee doesn't really work. So what did they do? They negotiated basically, you know, Cadillac is going to be paying double. They're going to be paying about allegedly about $450 million, which is not going to be the new dilution fee, which I feel like should be higher and should be somewhere in the $600 million range. So I think they're, they're getting a little bit of a deal to be allowed to come in before the new agreement. And then any other team afterwards that comes on will have to pay more. And I, I believe that 450 million for a dilution fee is, is very economical. I won't say cheap because that, you know, when you have that many zeros in front of it, how can any of that be cheap? It is, uh, and I, and my, my estimation is that the new Concord agreement in 2027 will be closer to 800. Right. It should, it should be closer to, to that. I, I think that when I first saw 450 million, I thought that was really low. And I was, you know, yes, there's a lot of zeros afterwards, but yeah. I still think that with all the hemming and hawing that all the team principals were talking about when the Andretti bid passed the FIA, I'm impressed and wonder how much of negotiation that was involved to get a number that I'm going to say is that low as 450 million. Well, I think it's, I think it is, uh, Based on the economics of the agreement, um, any team that you know would want to put up two hundred million should be uh, should be at least evaluated. But I think that the GM saw that there's you know the extended opportunity here over time, and feels that their investment of four hundred fifty million will come back to them probably within uh, you know a twenty four month period. So by the time they're ready to go with it, with the uh, uh, next set of uh, upgrades and changes to the cars, it will create, you know, that opportunity that they need to be really profitable in this uh, in this next configuration. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, th I think that it's this this is, you know, talking about, you know, the Honda team and their, you know, how how 
careful they are economically, I think that this is a good investment for, you know, Cadillac and GM. And I think speaks to what you were talking about earlier about, you know, the the idea of bringing in more engine suppliers and how Formula One is additionally more agreeable to that than, say, a guy whose last name happens to be Andretti from the family of Andretti wanting to start their own Formula One team. So I, I think that the the idea like the idea of us having a a new Formula One team similar to the situation with Haas is a, something that I don't think that we're going to see in Formula One probably ever again. And I think it really will be, you know, based on these massive car company constructors that want to bring in their brand to Formula One. And especially in, you know, in a year where 2025 is going to be a whole new landscape of major sponsors and branding for Formula One that you have to come into this with a butt ton of money. And that's something that a car manufacturer can do. Yes. And, and let's face it, GM is a global brand. Cadillac, Mm -hmm. not so much, mostly an American brand, but GM has factories in Europe and Japan and, you know, in Asia. So they are major suppliers around the world. And that creates marketing opportunities in each of those markets. Um, right, and, exactly. And what's also, I think, very interesting um, is if you think about it, if Enzo Ferrari came around in 2020 and said, hi, I want to create a, a Formula One team, they would all look at him and laugh. Right. Yeah. Like the, the days of people, you know, people slash former motorsport drivers, you know, Frank Williams waking up and saying, I'm going to have my own Formula One team now. The Fittipaldis did that for a while. All of this was talked about in our genealogy series, which we have linked the, the playlist up above. But that is, that is, has been rare and rare. We've seen over the last few decades, it's really been, you know, clothing brands or car brands that have come in and, or, cigarette brands back when that was that was legal those were the entities that were sponsoring these formula one teams and now we're just shifting into this era where it's not you know a fizzy sports drink like red bull but it's car manufacturers yeah. that want to get and, in and on the, motorsport and the only other uh i think owner in the united states that could have put something up that i believe really had no interest would be roger penske yes yes yeah. i i, I don't think I just don't know how the Penske brand, I just don't think it would go beyond the United States. Exactly. And that's, that's my point. That's my point. Right. Yeah. So it could be, but speaking of the United States, obviously we're going to have a new American team and new American team means new American driver. Maybe, but not necessarily. Yeah, so the the idea when Andretti came on was let's have, you know, American team, American driver. Two American drivers is probably completely unrealistic because the most successful American driver in the formulas right now, I feel like is Leo Block in Formula is in the F1 Academy. So that's you know, she's not ready for for, you know, joining an American Formula 1 team at the moment, but she is, you know, learning in the academy but that doesn't leave you a lot of options with viable drivers for formula one from the united states i don't think and i think that the only serious name right now is colton herta and i would i would agree with you the only the the major issue that i see and and yes we're talking about Andretti Global, where Colton Herta is contracted to until 2027. And could they transfer the contract? Probably. Does he have uh, enough super, you know, super license points? Probably no. not. Definitely okay. not. He, he, does, he does not currently. Yeah. Is there time? Maybe. He, the answer is, the, is there time? Yes. But the odds when you have... Uh, you know, only 20 to 22 drivers versus 33 drivers in Indy. Uh, and, and there are more drivers in Indy that race to qualify than the actual 33 that are in the race. It's not only 33. Right. So, Which is why IndyCar have, is so weird and I can't wrap my head around it. Right. You have, you have much less of a chance 
to get those uh, get those points that you need. And as I said, Colton is contracted to Andretti Global until 2027. And, right. you know, could he make twice as much money going to, to TWG? Probably. Would Michael want to transfer that contract with a certain buyout clause? I'm sure he would. I just, I just, I just don't see it. I just don't see I, it. I really think that Hertz's biggest problem is his lack of super license. Um, he, you know, he, he was kind of a name for an Alpha Tauri seat a couple of years ago, but for, you know, FIA wouldn't give him an exemption on his super license. And the problem is IndyCar doesn't get a lot of super license points. So super license points, as we've, as we've talked about in, in episodes past, but I'll, I'll give you the refresher here, is in the championship position, you get a number of super license points. And the minimum number of super license points for Formula One, I believe, is 40. Colton Herzer right now has 32. But to compare IndyCar and Formula 2, right now in Formula 2, if you finish first, second, or third, you get your 40. Whereas in IndyCar, if you finish first, you get your 40. But if you finish anywhere below that, you're getting at max 30. So Colton Herta would have to win IndyCar next year in order to have his super license for 2026. And now there are other ways to get super license points. Logan Sargent, for example, he got some from where he finished in Formula 2 before he joined Formula 1. And you also get points on your super license for amounts of testing that you do and for these free practice sessions that the rookies do. So he could do a bunch of those. But I think that there might be better non-American options that... Cadillac would go with and the two that really stand out to me are Alex Palo who's a Spanish driver and Pato Award who is not only a Mexican driver but is a freakishly popular Mexican driver to the you know rate of like Sergio Perez he was in Mexico during the Mexico City Grand Prix weekend and he did a couple public appearances that were just jam-packed with fans like they are obsessed with this guy yeah and I think that that's, you know, you, you raise an important, port in, yeah, yeah. Words. It, important point here that a lot of the uh, driver selection will have to be part of whatever marketing campaign that can be brought through that driver. And in my right. personal opinion, uh, you, if you have a driver that has Formula One experience, that's going to be incredibly valuable. So if you take a, and I'm not suggesting that any of these are viable, but if you take a, a Dan Ricardo or a Valtteri Bottas, Bottas or a, a Kevin Magnussen, and I think that even um, uh, Mick Schumacher has been bandied about, these are people that have experience on the Formula One circuit on a day in and day out basis for the entire season. They will be valuable as you develop your team. Now, given that, you have a chance to create a, a youth or and a farm program where you can have, uh, you know, young, in, you know, uh, aspirational drivers that can create buzz, especially within the, uh, you know, the market share that you're looking for. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually you know, very interested to see if we can, you know, you know, get a, get a woman involved, uh, as a driver. I think that Abby pulling while not American would be an excellent, excellent driver and an excellent marketing opportunity for formula one. Right. Um, Abby pulling who is in formula one Academy right now, she is currently the championship leader. We'll talk a little bit more about F1 Academy in a little bit, but is she ready for formula one right now in 2024? Probably not. Could she be ready by 2026? Maybe. It's a poss it's a possibility. It's a possibility. And I think it would be a really big gamble that I don't know if Cadillac would be willing to do. Um, I really think that they're going to go with an experienced 
Formula One driver from this current year's grid and somebody that is probably not in the series right now. So that would be, you know, Herta, Palau, Award, maybe even pulling. Um, Jack Crawford is another American option. He's currently top five in Formula Two and has had some some success there. And he's also part of the Andretti family as a reserve driver, development driver in Formula E. So that could be an option. Other I, the thing about the Formula One candidates is I don't know about Botas because he's been busy teasing, you know, what's next and getting tattoos on his leg and, you know, sending out um, Botas butt, um, uh, Christmas cards. And Kevin Magnuson is... He's a he's a decent driver, but he is a little bit on the older side in the grand scheme of current Formula One. The other idea would be someone like Felipe Dragovic, who is the current Aston Martin reserve driver and former F2 champion. And Logan Sargent, I also don't think is going to be a candidate either because he's just, he, no. he, and, and I don't if, think he's if, coming back to Formula One. Not any, not any time soon, unless he brings, he brings bags of money with him. Uh, yeah. you know, and there are, there are other options that, that may become available. And, you know, we'll talk, we may talk about this later with, you know, uh, the problems with Checo Perez. Well, and, we can talk about that now. Okay. Well, the, the, the problem with Checo Perez is, you know, yes, he has a contract with Red Bull, but he has not been performing and, and creating, uh, any, uh, lift to the, uh, constructors championship aspirations of Red Bull. So if he's Correct. out, if he's out, my personal opinion, and it has, you know, it goes as far as that is that there's a great opportunity here for Franco Colapinto to come into that, to that second spot. Now, At what does that what does that at Red Bull? Yes. At, what does that do to an Isaac Hadjar, who is a reserve driver for Red Bull? Red Bull. But but you know, in two years, may be interested in being loaned out to a GM Cadillac. That is that is true. the 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 other issue that we have here right now is there is still such a log jam of people in the Red Bull family. Hadjar specifically, we're assuming that Liam Lawson is going to take the second Red Bull or not the second Red Bull seat, but the second V Carb seat that he's in right now next year. If Red Bull doesn't get rid of Perez, honestly. Red Bull should get rid of him. I think that what they will do is they will take his contract and they'll cut it in half and they'll just give him the one year instead of the two year that he has right now that he signed earlier this year. But I also think that Cadillac might be a good place for Perez to go to, to just get him out of Red Bull, but also keep him in Formula One because he is still a very good driver who just kind of sucks right now. And he's very marketable, especially in the Latin American Extremely. Yeah, he has extreme financial backing, which we know is why he still has the seat. And Cadillac could see the, you know, 30 plus million dollars he brings in every year and say, oh, hey, which also somebody else who brings in about 30, you know, plus, you know, million dollars a year is Zhou Guan Yu. But I really don't think Zhou Guan Yu is going to be in the equation at all. But I I just, I just, I I, well, I'd like to see that. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I, just, I just don't think he's going to be back anytime soon. I think he might take a reserve driver somewhere. It's probably not going to be with Ferrari, but we'll see. And then, you know, Danny Ricardo, I don't know if he's going to want to try another, like, a, you know, another shot again. He might want to. He's basically an American driver at this point. So that would be a really good marketing strategy for Cadillac. But I just don't know if he would be interested in it. Plus, he would be off for the next not one, not two years, one next year, he would be, you know, he'd be off. Botas will be also be off next year. So the question is, is if, are they going to take a driver who's still on the grid in 2025, or is it somebody who's going to be, you know, off the grid, not driving for a year or not driving in, you know, this echelon of motorsport for a year. Exactly. And, and, but the nice thing about uh, uh, Danny Rick is that, you know, he's been adopted by so many people in so many countries, he can just slide right into that, you know, that nationality at, you know, at the drop of a hat. Right. Like how we all forget basically that Botas is actually a Finnish driver, not an Australian driver at this point. Exactly. Exactly. 
So yeah. So there's still a lot of time between now and when Andretti, not Andretti, when Cadillac, who is totally not Andretti, shows up on the grid. So the the idea of who's going to drive for them is probably going to be one of those like silly season topics that we've been talking about all year long in this year's podcast. And it's going to be a ton of speculation. But I do think that it wouldn't surprise me if we see someone like Alex Palou or Pato Award as one of the two drivers. And it also wouldn't surprise me if they don't have an American driver, but they have a driver who is from, you know, the the North South American side of the country. World, um, I think what will what will be important to watch, especially in 2025, and being this this being the podcast where we only look to the future, mm-hmm. um, watch watch your free practice ones, and see if there are any unusual names that come in for practice time, and that will be some indication as to where uh, you know the possibilities you know some of these drivers might land, especially with GM Cadillac. Exactly. I I don't disagree with you there. And speaking of free practices, I want to just make a completely unrelated point, but I saw a headline that said Max Verstappen to miss Abu Dhabi practice one. And I'm like, that's a weird headline because the real headline is there's going to be a rookie driver in the mandated rookie driver seat that Max needs to give up. So he's not missing it. He's not going to just not be in Abu Dhabi on that Friday. He's just not going to be driving in the car. So like the way that the, the headline was framed when I saw it today, it was like, that's misleading. I agree with you. And, and immediately when I saw that, I was like, oh, someone else is taking his drive for free practice one. It's as simple right, as that. Exactly. Yeah. So and I just, the way it was framed, I was just like, so he's not missing it. He's just not going to do it because he needs right. to give up his, his seat. And of course, next year they will start with um, every driver will have to give up two free practice ones for rookie drivers. Correct. Correct. And because this is a sprint week, um, it, you know, you are much less, you know, it's, it's almost impossible for anyone to want to give up their free practice one because oh, you're that's not doing you- it in, in a sprint weekend. No. In a sprint week. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Which we love speaking so dearly. Of, yeah. So speaking of sprints and being never able to talk about the pre- the present, let's talk about the past real quick because Qatar 2023, if you've been listening to this podcast at any length of time, is one of our most referenced races this year for a lot of reasons. One, because we really just went in on why sprints were a problem, which Fortunately, this year, the sprints have been better, but most importantly, this actually two other most importantly is one most importantly is half the grid almost, you know, died because the conditions were so bad. And the other most importantly, it was Oscar Piastri's first race win of any kind in Formula One, which was completely overshadowed by Max Verstappen clinching the driver's championship for that season in the sprint after not winning it. Exactly. Yes. And I, I was, you know, we have talked, and I know that you have talked on this broad, uh, on this podcast before about, you know, the fact that, in your opinion, uh, if I can speak for you, that uh, Oscar will win a championship before Lando will. Yes, correct. Still think yeah. so. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, but, you know, and yeah, there were there were all kinds of problems with that were heat stroke related. I mean, uh, Esteban Ocon, you know, throwing up in his helmet. You yeah. know, uh, you know. Alban and, Laura and and Stroll going to the medical facility for heat exposure. You know, Sergeant had heat stroke. I mean, it was really a very, very difficult race. Yeah, it, yeah. it was very difficult. And also, like, we know that Formula One is challenging, but we don't want Formula One to be challenging in the sense that it's going to kill the drivers challenging. Like, that's not the point. So <laughs> fortunately... One of the, and one of the reasons why it was so difficult is because this was six weeks earlier in the year last year and weather conditions in Qatar, you know, deserts are weird, but the deserts are less awful when it's like in the middle of December because it actually kind of cools off and doesn't, you know, go to 120 degrees. And I think it was also like extremely humid that week last yes. year. So. Fortunately, it's a lot less humid. There's not going to be much rain. There's like 20% chance of rain in the forecast um, on Friday, which is nothing. But the conditions will be, the the challenges won't be in the weather conditions this this time, this year, fortunately. I 
I, I took a look at the weather, you know, being a statistician and one of the things you do when you start a match, especially if it's an outdoor sport like football, American football, yep. is you check the weather and yep. you check the time. So, you know, the weather in Lusail, Qatar will be in the mid seventies, which will be very comfortable temperature wise. I think that the, the biggest issue they're going to have is wind. Yes, which we saw in Vegas was one of the challenges was just how windy, you know, the, the track was and how that impacts, you know, aerodynamics and airflow and the, you know, even the, the wings. So it'll be interesting to see what setups the cars use this year. Um, I also want to point out that one of the other big issues last year, there were two big issues, but we'll get to the second one in a second. But the other big issue was track limits. And track limits led to a lot of problems in qualifying, including Oscar Piastri finding out that he lost pole in the middle of being interviewed about getting pole. So that's something that that we'll we'll have to look out for. In I think it was turns twelve and thirteen, if I, if I remember correctly. So it'll be really interesting to see if that translates to another problem this year, or if we're going to get something different in twenty twenty four. Most importantly the curbs have been reprofiled because if you remember anything from catch our 2023 was that the curbs of that track, which is, this is a moto GP track first mm -hmm. and foremost, that is also something that you can use in formula one, but the curbs were, were basically like little triangles that were just hell on the Pirelli tires. And Pirelli came out and said, you can do 18 laps on these tires and then you must come in and pit. So that's how, that's how they were rated for. Obviously this is not the first time we've had issues like that. The 2005 U S Grand Prix comes to mind, which we have a whole episode on that's linked above, but the curves have been re reprofiled. The, the pointy little, little triangle wedges have been shaved off. So we, we'll be able to have an unlimited uh, tire situation, at least, you know, as, as, as you would usually on, on this track. I think I, that, that it, I am you know, actually going to be thankful for in this, in this time of Thanksgiving in the U S but it, I also think that you're going to have some situations, especially on those turns where there are, you know, with where the gravel gets kicked up that there right. are going to be some issues, especially early in the race when everyone is jockeying for uh, position as they, as they come out of the start. Right. So that's going to be a significant, significant issue um, is, are those, are those uh, gravel traps. Yeah, it'll it'll be really interesting to see, but I think that we're gonna have a, a we're we're gonna completely have a, a different race or two different races between the sprint and the Grand Prix compared to to last season, and I think it will be it will be better in a lot of ways, and hopefully it will also be something exciting because we had a really good race in Vegas. Let's let's keep the trend going through the end of the year. I'm yes. I'm right there with you because uh, you know we have. We have not been big fans of these sprints, but you know, I, I do have to say that they have improved, uh, especially in the latter half of the season. Yeah, this this format is much better. So we'll 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 see how this goes as the last sprint of this year. And then the the other big question is 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 McLaren going to win the constructors championship in Qatar this weekend? Well, I have some thoughts about that as we get into our predictions, but I'll save that. Okay. For so the moment. right now, mathematically, it's difficult, but they can and there there's basically one route for them to do so. They have to go 1 2 in the sprint, 1 2 in the grand prix and get fastest lap. Now, is this possible? Yes. Is this going to happen with the way that Oscar Piastri has been driving lately? I don't think so. But so the answer is McLaren can win, but Red Bull and Ferrari cannot clinch in Qatar. That is um, correct. Red Bull, yes. Red Bull will probably be ruled out after this weekend unless Sergio Perez miracles himself a victory in the actual Grand Prix, but I doubt it. But Ferrari could hopefully, you know, keep themselves in pace to make this a one-two showdown in Abu Dhabi, but... Ferrari is also not very strong on this track. So it will be very interesting to see what they're going to be able to pull out to stop McLaren and take this into, you know, a final showdown in Abu Dhabi. Also real quick, completely unrelated, but Gonzaga just lost to West Virginia in overtime. 
Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm heartbroken. I know. I, I figured that's... you would be. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yes. I, I think that's, you know, I was, this has been a big upset weekend in college basketball. That so I like it. I like it. Yeah. So, uh, I, everything that you have said, I agree with wholeheartedly about, uh, you know, you know, who can clinch, who can clinch what, when I think that, uh, what we're going to see most likely Red Bull is going to have their struggles, but I think that Mercedes has brought whatever upgrades they have brought over the last three, uh, three weeks of the season. I think they could be spoilers for McLaren and I'll talk more about that later. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't disagree. And I don't think that my, my, my predictions, I don't think are going to reflect that, but I do think that, the that Mercedes will continue the the strong weekend that they had, you know, starting from Vegas, even though the temperatures were about 30 degrees cooler than what we're going to have here in in Qatar. So that'll be interesting. But let's go into predictions. Um, as you know, we predict pole, podium, and P10. And on sprint weekends, we also do sprint pole, sprint podium, and sprint P8. And then also who's going to be, you know, uh, who's going to give us our biggest surprise and who is going to do our dumb. Now, Emily from the deserted island did send in her predictions that I need to find in our DMs as one does. But once I find them, we can start. There they are. I found them. So who do you have for sprint poll? Uh, for sprint poll, I actually have Oscar Piastri. Okay. I picked Lando and Emily also picked Lando. So McLaren don't fail us now. I think Oscar has, you know, and, and you're, you know, when, when I talk about my race pole and my race podium, uh, you'll see I am I am looking for a couple of the uh, un- underperforming underdogs to actually come through this weekend and create some real havoc in terms of the constructors. Okay, let's see. So, who is your sprint podium? Uh, sprint podium is and don't hate me for this, but it is it is Lewis, Oscar, and Max. Interesting. Okay. So you're going from right off the bat and saying that McLaren's not going to clinch the championship this weekend. That is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. I have, that is not what I wanted to tap. I have a, I actually have Lando Norris converting from pole and then I have Max and then I have George. Uh, Cause I just, I feel like of the two Mercedes, George has consistently been better than Lewis, even though Lewis is Lewis. So I think that we're going to see another another solid performance from George. I wanted to say one of the Ferraris. I originally had Ferraris involved, but then I remembered Ferraris are bad in Qatar. So we'll we'll see what they can do. And also, I didn't want to pick Carlos because Carlos can't finish in a sprint any higher than P5 or I, any lower I, than P5. I, under, I understand that. I picked Lewis over George simply because had I, I truly believe had Vegas been five laps longer, I think Lewis would have caught George and overtaken George. Yes, yes, I, I agree with you that he it was it was getting close there for, for a bit. Yes, yes yeah. it was. And, and right. theoretically in the same car in the same setup, he was mm. uh, gaining gaining uh, some good traction there. Right. So then for P8, which is the last um, points finishing uh, place in a sprint race, who do you have for your sprint P8? I have our dear friend, the Hulk. Okay. I picked, who did I pick? I picked Esteban Ocon. So I think uh-huh. that he might, I think he's going to the rebound after the absolute mess that was last weekend. And then Emily, shockingly enough, she picked Sergio Perez. Wow. I know, right? I mean, that, that, that's like, that she's, she's going to revisit Vegas all over again. Apparently, which I I am shocked that she picked it. Also, please know that Emily picked these predictions before she left for her deserted island about a week ago. So nothing considering she she does not know about what it's going to take for McLaren to clinch the championship because, as I said, she's on a deserted island. So these are all coming from just vibes, apparently. Works for me. 
Yeah. All right. So who is your pick for pole position for the Grand Prix? I am going to pull a rabbit out of my hat and say that uh, pole is going to be Carlos Sainz. Okay. I think, I think Ferrari is going to figure it out and is going to uh, get pole. Very interesting because I think the opposite of that. I picked Lando again for pole and Emily picked Charles Leclerc. So Emily is on your same page of uh-huh. Ferrari drivers. And well, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to hold up the future Williams of the world. That is completely fair. And he is also based on everything that we've been seeing this week. Things at Ferrari have not been great. Apparently both drivers were summoned to Fred Vassour's office, wherever that office may be. I don't think it's the the office in, in Italy. I think it's his office at Qatar to figure out the strife between them that I think we forget has been like there has been some discord between Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc, like basically all season, the Ferraris just haven't been relevant enough for it to matter in the media. So it kind of, you know, disappeared until this absolute mess that was Vegas. Well, as, 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 as Charles did say, you know, maybe it it would be better if they explained things to him in Spanish. Right. Exactly. So we'll (laughs) see. Um, All right. Who is your podium? My podium is uh, Carlos, Max, and Lewis, and okay. I am I am in in these last number of races and and mostly in the desert races. What we've seen is whoever takes pole has been able to run away with things for a bit. So if I'm going to stick with uh, Carlos as my pole sitter, uh, then I believe he will end up taking podium. Okay, very interesting. And that all is contingent on Ferrari not screwing him over, which of we know is is never a guarantee. So Correct. my pick for podium is going to be Lando, George, and Lewis. I think that we're going to see a completely different McLaren that we've seen in Vegas. And then I think that the, the Mercedes are going to continue. And then I think after that will like be Max and then the Ferrari drivers, or maybe Max in with the Ferrari driver somewhere just outside the podium. So, so you also agree that uh, 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 McLaren is not going to win the uh, constructors this week? No, I do not think so. I think that would be, it, it is not my big surprise, but actually that is my big surprise. Spoiler alert, that is my big surprise of the weekend is that <laughs> is McLaren doing everything that they need to do to get, um, what's it going to, to get the constructors championship in Qatar. I think they're going to save the Salvatore t-shirts for Abu Dhabi. Uh, Emily also has uh does not does not have a uh, mclaren victory she has a charles leclerc carlos Sainz, max verstappen podium okay yeah. so we'll see how that goes and then our last spot p10 which we get three points for in our we haven't given points in months but we try anyway to predict these correctly who is your p10 uh my p10 is esteban Ocon. okay I can see that. Emily's is Alex Albon, which I want to to think that that Al, that Albon and Williams could do anything of positivity and get into the points, but not after the last couple of weeks. So <laughs> uh, the the fact that they're going to have a car that they can field in Qatar, I think is very impressive, but and spare also parts. not very likely. I, I don't know how many spare parts they have after, uh, you know, Colatino's crashes yeah. and the fact that, you know, Albon's, you know, radiator exploded or whatever yep. it did. My pick is Nico Hulkenberg. So, okay. We'll see. There you go. I like it. I like it. Yeah. So I already spoiled my big surprise is that McLaren would win the Constructors' Championship in Qatar. What is your big surprise for the weekend? My big surprise is I'm going to take the under on uh, safety cars and retirements. So in 2023, you had three safety cars and five retirements. So my prediction is that there will be one safety car and no more than two retirements. Okay, very interesting. We will we will see how that goes this weekend. Um, and then what is your, who is your who's going to do a dumb of the week? Oh, my, my dumb is that McLaren will screw it up and will end up, you know, having to go into Abu Dhabi to get the championship and then probably lose it because they didn't get enough points in Qatar 
to help them cover in Abu Dhabi. Good to know. Yeah, the the other thing to, to remember here is, and we, we talked about this last episode, Charles Leclerc still has a chance to overtake Lando for P2 in the championship. It's going to be difficult. Correct. The Ferrari, as we have said, is not very good in Qatar, which will, will not help, but there's still a chance that he can overtake him. And that's another thing to look at from the driver's standings wise, you know, going into to this race weekend and next race weekend. And then my dumb, speaking of Charles Leclerc, is Ferrari. I think that whatever is going to happen behind closed doors with Fred Vasseur is not going to take away from the fact that Ferrari's strategy is suspect as hell. And if they have another Ferrari strategy weekend like we had in Vegas, then I think that Ferrari is going to hand McLaren the Constructors' Championship, not in Qatar, but I think that they're going to make it a lot easier for McLaren to clinch it in Abu Dhabi. I, I, I would not disagree with you. I think that also Mercedes will have something to say about this. Also Mercedes. That is correct. So we have had a lot of thoughts. What are your final thoughts on this coming weekend in Qatar? I am hoping for a, uh, a, a good sprint and a great race. I think that it will, you know, with, with the weather being better, um, and having to deal with the wind, especially in those specific terms where you know, turns where crosswinds can be problematic, mm -hmm. we're going to see some interesting racing. But, you know, I am hoping for something that is uh, very competitive and entertaining. I'm here for that as well. So now that we have covered to, to death Qatar and Formula One and the Cadillac entry uh, coming in two years, let's talk about F1 Academy because it's been a while since we've seen F1 Academy. I know we've been talking about them basically all episode, but we have an F1 Academy weekend this weekend. And Fantastic. this is, this is the, the penultimate F1 Academy weekend. We still don't have a, we know that Abby Pulling is probably going to win the championship, but it's, probably not going to be until next weekend in Abu Dhabi, but we have F1 Academy. There's been a lot of news F, um, from the F1 Academy lately. Their 2025 calendar came out. I know we touched on that in our, our pre-Vegas news roundup. I'm also really excited to see these new drivers. So far, we have had one, two, three, four, five new drivers who have been announced, including two wildcard drivers that we've seen this season and one driver who is moving teams, which I think is fascinating in her in her second really? year yeah so to start we have the tommy hilfiger driver um alba herp lawson who was the 2023 winner of the fia girls on track rising stars award which came into existence around the same time as formula one and made her debut this year in single seat seater in indian f4 then we have our Miami wildcard driver, Courtney Crone, is driving for Haas next year. So she is is moving and she was um, she drove in. She tested in the W series a few years ago ah. when the W series existed. RIP. Mm -hmm. Then we have the new RB V carb driver. So as you know, there are three Red Bull drivers on the, on the grid. One is from Red Bull. One is from Red Bull Academy and one is from V carb. Next year's V carb driver will be Rafaela Ferreira, who is the first, um, she's a Brazilian driver. She has been driving for a few years now and it was the first female race winner in Brazilian F4. Very exciting for her. And then right. McLaren snapped up the Singa the Singapore wildcard driver, Ella Lloyd, who I believe scored points in the Singapore Grand Prix weekend and just finished her season in British F4. And then here's the, the I think, the biggest one. Red Bull Ford picked up Chloe Chambers from Haas this year. She's a race no winner. Way. She is... Haas's only race winner in the entirety of their motorsport program in the the formula side and I think this is this is a huge get for Red Bull especially since the Red Bull drivers that they have had this year the the Alcobasi sisters and Emily DeHughes haven't really panned out that's that's actually that's that's a lot of movement I'm I'm actually very surprised by the you know you know what you know, new opportunities are, and it's it's very good to see that uh, Susie Wolf has has really created a culture there that allows for people to come in. And I know that you graduate from the F1 Academy after a period of time, but yeah. the the turnaround I think is very good for women in sports. I'm, I applaud that. 
Right. So as this is the, the second year of F1 Academy right now, we have a large number of drivers who will be graduating out into the, the lower formulas and probably doing a lot of like British F4 types of stuff and a lot of stuff in international F4s. But yeah, this this is going to be really interesting to see how the grid is going to change for, between this year and next year. I'm still waiting on the announcement of where Nina Gaidman is going to drive next year. She was the Zandvoort wildcard driver and one of the most impressive wildcard finishes this year. So it'd be really interesting to see where she goes, who stays, where they go. You know, Abby Pulling is out. Dorian Pond will probably stay because this is her first year. She is also mm -hmm. currently second in the championship but she is pretty far behind pulling right now. She would have to basically sweep each of the next four races in order to stop Abby from winning the championship. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying, you know, that's that's 95 points there. That's that's a big number. Yeah, there are still a lot of points left because we do have two races this weekend races. and then two races next weekend. So it could be, we'll see. But yeah, right now the standings are Abby pulling, Dorian Pond. Pond was also, she did um, she did Jimmy Kimmel the other night in the, in the States, which I thought was very like out of left field. Like I, I, it was like, it, it popped up in my YouTube recommends and it was like, that's not the motorsport driver that I would expect to be doing American late night TV. But it was it was cool and it's great for the exposure that they were able to to you know get her on the show and that they wanted her on the show. So that was that was pretty cool. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Then we've got Maya Vug in third, Chloe Chambers, who is at Haas um, moving to Red Bull next year in fourth, and Norea Marti, who's the current Tommy Hilfiger driver in fifth with 101 points. So the battle between for P3 is actually really tight right now. And yep it'll be really interesting to see if, if Vu can hold on from a constructor side. I know that we really forget about the constructors in F1 Academy because the formula one team partnerships really take precedence, but there are five different constructors. Um, Prima racing is up seven points on road and motorsports. Campos is behind in third with 228 points. And then ART Grand Prix and MP Motorsport have six points between them. So they're just really kind of fighting and switching between fourth and fifth basically from race to race. So it'll be interesting to see how the final constructor standings shape out by the end of the year. It, it, it will. I think that, you know, if, if Campos comes up with, you know, four really good races, it throws the, that top three into a lot of turmoil. Exactly. So that'll be, I don't, I don't know how easy it would be for them to overtake. We also right. will have a wild card entry in Qatar, British driver. And I know that one of the like whole points of all of this was like getting local drivers, but I don't know if women can drive in Qatar. So that might be part of it. Um, or maybe that's Saudi Arabia. One of those Middle Eastern countries where women can't drive. But Alicia Pomalski will be driving. She is the GB4 vice champion with three wins, two poles, and 11 podiums this year. So she's got a solid footing under her. This is probably an audition for next year, just like it has been with Gaidman and Lloyd. So it'll be interesting to see how she performs this weekend. Sounds great. I mean, it's it, anytime you can do that on a on a track where they're going to have Formula One uh, racing and even Formula Two racing is a great opportunity. Yeah, it, it'll it'll be great. And I also just love like seeing like going from watching Formula One practice to watching Formula One Academy and just seeing like the difference in size between the cars and like the difference of how technical these cars are. It's fascinating. There's there's such a leap in between them, which is another thing of like for Abby pulling, how close can she get to Formula One is is a real question because it's it really is so different, you know, an F1 Academy car to a Formula One car that I think it would take a lot in two years to get her into Formula One. And I also, you know, this is the long game in getting more women into the lower formulas and into F3, F2, F1. So would Cadillac have an opportunity to bring a female driver onto the grid? Yeah. Are we going to see it? Probably not. I mean, it's the same thing when, when everybody was talking about Jamie Chadwick and I think Jamie Chadwick was even further ahead of someone like Abby Poling and yep. everyone looked at Jamie Chadwick and said, uh, no. So. Right. But you know, there is, you know, you know, there is no lack, lack of trying. And I believe if I'm not mistaken that Abby Poling has tested in a formula one car. 
Uh, yes, off off uh, off weekend testing. I believe she has off weekend testing. Yes, so I think that you know that gives at least a baseline as to where her talents lie, and you know if there's a possibility, I think it creates uh, some incredible buzz for uh, F1 and for the team that uh, they are associated with. I don't disagree. So. We'll see about that, and we'll see just, you know, if we can have maybe a different winner in an F1 Academy race that isn't Abby pulling Maya Vug and Dorian Pond, that'd be that'd be interesting. We haven't had one in a while. I think Chloe Chambers might have been the most recent non-pulling win, but it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Um, obviously, we've been talking for an hour. We don't need a fun fact. The fun fact is all the stuff that we talked about in Cadillac and GM and Andretti with a different hat. So... Um, up next, we'll have our Catch Our Grand Prix reaction, which, as always, will be out on Monday. And that's that's all I got. Any any more thoughts from you? Nope. Looking for forward to another great weekend of racing, and let's see what uh, you know. I'll be up. I'll be up at the appropriate time. So let's see what uh, transpires in uh, beautiful Lucille, Qatar. Yeah, fortunately, timing wise, this is not an awful race. I don't have to wake up at, you know, 4 a.m. like I will have to um, next week for Abu Dhabi. So we'll see. Uh, But anyway, that's been the podcast. Thanks for going off track with us. Thank you.